Thank you. Good morning, and uh, thank you to Whitehall Media for hosting this wonderful event and the opportunity to share what I hope you will find to be a very interesting story. You know, 9-11 was, what, 17 years ago. Um, you've heard a lot of things about 9-11. Somebody screwed up some people who wanted to attack the United States were very smart. Um, let me tell you, none of that is exactly right. So Bill and I are here to share with you the real skinny about 9-11, the story that has not been published, that has not been told, perhaps not even allowed to be told, depending on who's controlling what media outlets these days. So let's begin with a very famous guy. That's not the NSA, but this guy. This gentleman, you may know if you've studied history, played an uh, important role in World War II, Supreme Allied Commander Europe, Dwight David Eisenhower, did a marvelous job and was recognized by the American people by making him our president. It's not what he did during his presidency that I want to bring to your attention. It's what he said, these words, when he said goodbye. He was done. Please, just take a moment and contemplate the words because it is so relevant to what we encounter today. The military industrial complex. How many of you have heard of this term before? How many of you actually believe it exists? A few, but a lot of you are very positive, maybe dreaming a bit about what's possible, and that's a good thing. But be aware, there are people pulling strings, influencing processes in the background that aren't so obvious. We call it the dark side, that want to control the evolution of just about everything that um, surrounds societies, including IT processes, IT markets. They want to know first where we're headed. Why? Because they depend on information for their own purposes, whatever those may be. Now, what Eisenhower observed after World War II is that the U.S., which had never had a continuous standing army, even in the West, these things really didn't exist. Muster armies were mustered up when there was a threat. But now technology had reached the point where weapon systems, things like submarines, missile silos, could not be stood up overnight. They had to be kept running to keep the precision and to keep the capability to adapt new technologies. So out of that, he saw a coalition of government, mainly the military, and industry coming together, locking arms, while the rest of America, or the West, watched. This created the opportunity for playtime, influencing parliament, influencing Congress, using money perks, benefits. How many of you believe corruption is an active part of our daily lives in the way we run our countries? Ah, more hands. There's hope here. All right. Forward 40 years to the NSA. What an unfortunate set of circumstances. Now let me set the stage for you as though you could peer into that building and see what existed architecturally serving the defense of the United States. It was a mess. Imagine 600 databases. Imagine 400 stovepipes. 
Imagine 147 applications. Imagine 27 languages. Imagine crypto kinds of capabilities. Encipherment, the need to decrypt. That's what was there when Bill and I encountered 9-11. Now there was a small component at NSA <coughs> that got it. They saw the network, the digital age coming at us, the internet, the problems of real-time data, huge volumes, constantly changing protocols. How do you <coughs> keep up with that? The real metaphor is, how do you sip from a fire hose? Imagine that. We need data. Without data, we're nothing. We learn nothing. We have nothing to build knowledge from. So Bill, along with a handful of other people, I was one of them, and uh, proud that I was, and it was a good time. <laughs> but there was a tragedy about to happen. We knew something was going to happen. We could feel it. And there was a great urgency within the team to produce results. And we tried, and we tried, and failed, and failed. But through trial and error, we eventually learned that you can't take the internet and shove it in a relational database. Immediate failure. So we had other ways of dealing with that kind of speed. And we had the issue of volume. What are you going to do with all that data? You've got to sip. You've got to filter it. You have to know how to select from this. And that's where metadata came in. And Bill will tell you more about that uh, when he gets up here. Content is expensive. A lot of storage, bit intensive, CPU intensive, high cost. Content, most of it's junk. Most of what you talk about on your phones is not worthy of analysis. Why store all that if you don't need it? But more importantly, why store the communications of innocent people? Well, I'm going to tell you why the NSA and their friends called GCHQ nestled over here in the Cotswolds. You know where that is. There's a reason they defaulted, and Bill will get into that as well. What I want to talk about is what led specifically to 9-11 besides the technological challenges. The technological challenges were being mastered, but the people ones weren't. We had a bad culture. We had a guy came in. His name was General Michael V. Hayden. Have any of you heard of General Hayden? <laughs> Air Force general, hist formal education, history major. Had been in electronic security command. Had never done a major re-engineering project in his life. But the Bush family loved him. He had done favors for the first Bush president, George H.W. And so he got recommended to the younger Bush, saying, Mike's a good guy. Why don't you make him head of NSA? They did it. A mistake they would come to regret. Hayden came to NSA with an agenda. It pretty much said this. This is the age of the internet. You people at NSA don't have a clue. You're stuck in that black box. You don't really understand what's going on in the outside world. So we're going to bring in, bring in major industry, Silicon Valley, and they're going to solve this thing. Now, he basically handed over NSA's future, the keys to industry, and asked them to solve it. Five years later, they said, we can't do it. We don't have an application this big. Five years of time lost. When you, now, internet time, you know the, the algorithm for internet time. <coughs> Rapid change. You don't keep up, you, get, you fall behind immediately. Same thing with intelligence. If you don't keep up with the net where most of the information is, you fall behind. In NSA, lost track of its targets in that five years. Biggest failure in NSA history. Management got together and said, boy, we screw up. Yeah, you did. And the machine that he had running, a prototype, was solving those issues, but they didn't pay attention. 
they didn't seek the knowledge points existing within that building. There weren't many, but there were a few. <clears throat> they didn't take advantage of them. Big consequence, because then we get hit with 9-11, 3,000 people die, simply because management didn't have the discipline to do the proper analysis, to do the knowledge management, to seek out the knowledge workers, such as Bill, who had already solved problems. Brought in industry, everything else was squashed, and the rest is history. So with that sort of a background, I want to, um, well, let me say one more thing. We tried to save the prototype. We tried to convince Hayden and his management team don't go off into the ether with a hope and a dream without mitigating your risk. Use the prototype we had working called Thin Thread. Keep that alive <clears throat> in case you fail. <clears throat> nope, threw it out. <clears throat> they were left hanging by a thread and that thread broke. And everything came crashing down and they accepted basically what turned out to be a default position that Bill's going to talk to you about, that has tremendous <clears throat> ramifications for our forms of government, <clears throat> our privacy, the rule of law, and how this kind of a system can be abused. With that, I turn it over to my colleague, <clears throat> Bill Benny. <laughs> Well, I'd like to give you a little background on how we got to where we are and why, uh, why I keep saying uh, bulk data kills people. In fact, uh, I was here testifying to the House of Lords not too long ago, talking about bulk data and what it was doing to them. And I gave them documented evidence of internal memos between NSA and uh, analysts and, and other analysts in NSA and also MI5 analysts, talking about too much data they can't figure anything out because they're buried. Well, so uh, there were two forces driving this at, uh, in, back in the United States. One was uh, Hayden and the, uh, and the uh, people in NSA. They wanted to get a bigger budget. They wanted to build a bigger intelligence empire. And also we had uh, Bush and Cheney in the White House who wanted to get uh, uh, information. Dick Cheney grew up under Richard Nixon, and he, Richard Nixon's policy was to know your enemy. There's know all your political enemies. Uh, so he had to have knowledge about all of, every, all of his opposition politically, so that meant he had to get, get data on everybody. So the drive was to collect everything on everybody from the White House and also get a bigger budget and build a big empire in NSA. So those are the two driving factors, and that led to collecting everything. That's why General Alexander came up here in, uh, I forget when it was, 2009 or something like that at Menwith Hill and said, our objective is to collect everything. And that's basically what they're doing. And the consequence of that is that people have to die to keep it going because they can't figure <coughs> out threats in advance. To give you the idea uh, for the collecting everything, uh, there are three ways they do it. The primarily, they're looking at the fiber optic network worldwide, and they're tapping it all over the place, hundreds of taps around the world. Uh, they use three approaches. One is look for the uh, companies that are running the fiber optic lines and try to bribe them or buy them or say, we'll, we'll give you money if you allow us to tap your line. Uh, and we'll also give you money for the amount of data we take off and we'll give you money to manage our tap. That is all the equipment and to keep it going and running. So uh, that's the main reason, that's the main way they try to do that. If they get their cooperation, that means they offload the, the business and the work to them and they get the benefits that way and all they have to do is give them money. Uh, otherwise, if the corporations don't, don't cooperate, then they go to foreign governments and they look at them as uh, assets and say, uh, you know, we need to cooperate and they get an agreement between each other to share knowledge and data. And so then, then they use them to tap the fibers and <laughs> use them to go to their local fiber optic line managers and go and see what they can uh, arrange for payments and so on. And the NSA or the US pays for it that way. And the third way is if we don't get cooperation from the companies or the foreign government, we'll just tap it unilaterally so that nobody will know we're tapping. We can do it underwater, you know, find, find the fiber optic line and we'll tap it. And so uh, th those are the three ways they get it. And basically that's, uh, that's uh, they're doing that to take the entire fiber, not just part of it, they take everything. And they have sessionizers do that. Uh, part of it, uh, it breaks down into two basic programs. Uh, you've seen, I think this PRISM program was one of the first ones exposed by uh, Edward Snowden, uh, but it was really a minor one. The real, one, the real program is upstream, and that's the one where they have all the fiber optic taps, and we'll go into some of this uh, 
Fairview, Storm Brew, and Blarney and Oak Star. Uh, those, those are the, comp the, the uh, first one, Fairview is AT&T, Storm Brew is Verizon. <laughs> Blarney is like 30 other companies, and uh, Oak Star is like nine different countries uh, that are cooperating with the Five Eyes group, the uh, English-speaking countries. Uh, and that's where the major collection of data comes. Uh, to give the example of the U.S., these are the taps inside the U.S. for the Fairview program. It's close to 100 taps. Uh, I, I went on Google, by the way, and searched it and found every one of these. I know the buildings and all for all these tap lines. So, uh, and I also did it for Stormbrew. But this is uh, clearly, you can see, it's distributed with the population of the United States. Here, the target is not foreigners. The target is the U.S. population. And this is the first one they went for because we were the closest. We had the, they had the access immediately, so that gave them. And besides, once they tapped the fiber lines inside the United States, they actually had 80% of the capacity of fiber around the world. So that gave them virtually 80% uh, of what's in the world, including all the U.S. people. So they're violating our constitutional rights for first, then they eventually got in the Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendments of the Constitution. They just scrapped them. It was all done in secret. They all knew they were, they were doing it illegally. It was illegally, unconstitutional. It was an impeachable act. And so they kept it all secret. So uh, then around the world, these are the other taps around the world. The biggest one is look down in the uh, lower right corner. There's CCNE. It says there's over 50,000 taps. And this is years ago, so there's more now. What that means is computer network exploitation. Those are, uh, that's equipment and, and software that they implant in switches and servers around the world so that they effectively own them. So that if there's anything passing through them or anything stored in them, they can drain it out or do whatever they want, manipulate it, send it any which way they want. Plus, they also put hundreds and hundreds of uh, trace route programs in these switches. So they monitor the, by the billions packets going everywhere. That's why I said if the Russians hack anything in the United States, NSA knows it. Because they've got all, these, all this access and all this capability. It's all digitally stored. They can back search everything using X key score and other kinds of programs to interrogate the database. It's pretty straightforward. <clears throat> um, and that's, uh, that's the world stuff. And these are the other countries that are participating. First party is US, second party are the other English speaking countries. And uh, then there are uh, third party countries. There's also a fourth party. We don't talk about them, though. <laughs> those, are, those are relationships we don't want anybody to know about. But uh, there are uh, something like nine or 10 now, I think, uh, third party countries participating. Most in the European area, but Japan also. So, uh, <clears throat> the ultimate objective, of course, is to look at every device on the network and see where it is every minute of the day, and then have with it all the content and, and uh, discussions, phone calls, emails, whatever you're sending, uh, to go with it and match it. So it's basically telling you what you're talking about, what you're thinking about, what you're expressing to other people, where you are when you're doing it. So, and also tracing you wherever you move, everywhere in the world. And I estimate that they're doing this for about 4 billion people in the planet, roughly. 280 million US people and you know, the rest <coughs> of everybody else. So at any rate, this is really their objective. Uh, this bulk approach, what it fundamentally means is they're buried in so much data they can't see any threat coming. And that's why people are getting killed. And then they go into the data and they say, oh yeah, we knew these people. Well, if you knew them, why aren't you? Because they're not focused, they're not focusing on them. They know them, but they can't follow them because they're looking at everybody. They're spreading their effort around. So I, I did the uh, estimate of the number of people uh, who might be involved in this. If you summed up all the analysts involved in all the countries, it's probably about 20,000 analysts. Well, if you divided that into 4 billion people, that's 200,000 people per analyst. No one, can, no one can do that. That's why you have to automate this entire process, which is what we were doing with the Thin Thread program. So we could look at the world. The whole idea was to how can you look into massive amounts of data and pull out what was relevant and let everything else go by because it's not, a, not, a, not of any significance. So, uh, and we did that by looking at metadata. I mean, that's the way we did the in analog world too. I've been doing this for about 50 years. So I knew, uh, you know, this was the same technique all the way back to the analog days. It's just you look at the metadata, not the data, because there's too much of it. When you start looking at it, you get buried. You know, it's just too much to look at. So when they do things like uh, with the uh, X-Keyscore or IC Reach programs interrogating that data, when you look at words or phrases or you know, anything like that, you get buried with data. It's like a Google search coming back. If they only did just the, uh, the known targets and the, and the technical parameters about, that would define them, like IPs or, or uh, phone numbers, things like that, they wouldn't be buried. 
but uh, by doing the X key score to do target development, meaning they're looking for new targets. They don't have rules or automation to do that, which we did and we were preparing to do, but didn't with ThinThread. Uh, they didn't implement those. So they're, they're back to just searching based on words or, or other kinds of properties. They're looking at phrases and things like that. So it just buries them. And so they can't figure it out. And that's what they're saying in their internal memos. And that's what I provided to the, to the uh, House of Lords uh, Committee <coughs> investigating the IP bill. So uh, <clears throat> the real way to do that is uh, what we were doing under, and this is an expanded version of that, under ThinThread, the program we were doing in the 1990s uh, was to whole, have a whole process like this automating the entire analysis process through the entire enterprise. If you didn't do that, you were buried immediately. That was our whole point back then. Uh, this, they, they are, I think they're now starting to realize that. I think in 2012, the White House issued a big, big uh, White House Big Data Initiative uh, which ask, was asking for algorithms to do this kind of thing that we were actually doing back in the 90s, they actually <laughs> threw it away. They did. They actually threw it all away because they outsourced everything to the contractors and dumped everything else. Uh, except for the programs that they needed to do the bulk acquisition. They took our programs, modified them to allow... We had a program right up front that filtered everything so that we never only took in relevant data right from the start, at the get-go. So, so we had that right on the fiber lines when the tapping, we were looking in and filtering and pulling only relevant data out. Uh, then if we did that and, and you were involved uh, and, or you were connected by, by our rules into with that bad people in some way, then all of your identifying properties were encrypted so that you couldn't tell who you were. Even inside NSA, you couldn't tell. So the NSA analysts couldn't do things like love int, love intelligence, where they looked at inside the data to look at their lovers to see if they're cheating on them which is what they did. Uh, because that just gives you the idea of the extent of the con content of data they're collecting. It's virtually everything. So, uh, and then you go through this whole process, and if you do it right, you can, you can uh, automate virtually everything that analysts are doing, and you push them up to a much, more, uh, a much higher level of analysis of really trying to get intentions and capability predictions. That's really what the intelligence is supposed to do. It's supposed to predict intentions and capabilities of potential adversaries, like threatens, like terrorist attacks or, or military threats or things like that in advance before they happen so you can do something to try to stop them. Uh, it's not a forensic job. They've reduced their entire process to being forensics after the fact. After people get killed, you look in the data, oh yeah, we knew all this stuff about them. Well, that doesn't help, you know. That's not the business of intelligence. So uh, this, is what, this is the idea of what we were doing back in those days, trying to uh, get, uh, get everything, capture the knowledge necessary to automate analysis of data of any type and get a result basically as far as we could push it. Some of that we were able to push right to the end to actually issue reports without any people involved at all. But other parts of it we couldn't. Uh, we were still working on it trying to get there. Uh, and that included this area of uh, digital uh, communications. Because the explosion was so great and we had so many different factors, it took a long time to try to capture that knowledge and we just didn't have enough time. By that time, they decided they were going to collect everything in the world and, uh, we, uh, and they had to use our programs to do it because that was the only one allowed. We, we first were able to capture and sessionize fiber optic lines in 1998. Uh, and that we, as far as I know, were the only ones in the world capable of doing that at the time in intelligence. Uh, so, uh, and then from there, uh, we, it was just a matter of space and power as to how much you could take in. So from there, they just took it and removed all the filtering, took in everything, then took our graphing and relational anal analysis here and, and uh, used that to analyze the data. And uh, from, from there, uh, uh, basically got rid of the protections. They, we also had another program running, uh, which was uh, kind of important. It was one monitoring our entire network, who came into it, where they went, what they did while they were there. So we knew everybody on the network, as they, what they were doing as they did it. So that if we didn't want them doing anything or we thought they were doing something wrong, we could easily intervene immediately and say, you're not allowed to do this. So, I mean, uh, that way Edward Snowden couldn't have downloaded what he did if they kept that. But they decided they didn't want to for two reasons. One, it let, it let us monitor everything the analysts were doing and they didn't want to be monitored. They said, you're going to look at everything I'm doing? Yes. Uh, uh, well, we could have used it for a training tool. If they were doing something that wasn't uh, 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 efficient or effective, we could say, you need training here. If you look at this training here, you might, you might figure out how to do that. Or we could use it to monitor, uh, to find new ways of doing things. If somebody was trying something new and it worked, we could pick that out too. 
So, uh, but that was one of the things they didn't want. But the real ones who opposed it were the managers at NSA. They said, you're gonna mean, you mean you're going to be able to tell return on investment on every program I manage and which ones are succeeding, which ones are failing, you know, and how I move money around? We said, yes, we could tell you all of that. And you mean uh, Congress can come in here and look at that data? We said, sure, they could do that. They said, you are never going to do that. So our program proposal lasted 1.5 months. That was it. Because, and that's the reason they couldn't tell how much data Snowden took or anything else. They still can't because they don't have that program. You, you might, that's, and those are the reasons why. Those two main reasons, the analysts and the managers. Managers, see, NSA is not audited by the U.S. government at all, nor is CIA. They're given uh, 10 to $16 billion a year. Well, that's a nice job to have, somebody give you 10 to $16 billion a year, and you don't have to account for any of it. I, I could take a million home a month and I'll never miss it, you know? No one's going to know, you know? And so that's a, that's a setup for corruption. That's exactly what we have. So, but at any rate, these are the things that uh, we, were, we were doing in the 1990s. This is the whole idea of enterprise, the enterprise analysis approach, and documenting and capturing that knowledge to make that happen automatically as much as possible without people. Because you, you can't hire enough people to handle all the data, right? There's just too much data. So, uh, <coughs> I, I wrote an article for uh, EDPL, uh, uh, European Data Protection Law magazine that talked about how to analyze big data. This is the kind of technique I've been using for like 50 years. <laughs> so I was trying to share that with everybody. And it's just going through uh, looking at how you look at data, what's important in the data right up front, what questions you want, and what aspects of that data will ac actually help you make answers or automatically uh, answer certain parts of that question. And those are the things you pick on to try to look into big data. You don't look at the content, because if you do that, you're buried immediately. So uh, those are the kinds of things we were doing. Uh, you can read through these if you want, or you can go look at the EDPL uh, magazine of earlier this year, April, I think it was, uh, and you can get the write-up. But it, uh, the whole idea is that uh, looking at metadata will allow you to look into large and massive amounts of data and be able to see things you need or want out of that and also be able to process the data automatically to a certain extent at least. So, But this is what we were saying would give you uh, privacy for people and give you answers for, for security. So you can have security and privacy both. There's no, it's been a lie from the beginning. You had to give privacy up for security. That's been a lie. And they knew that at NSA, by the way. They just didn't want to adopt the uh, approach that we took because it only cost me $3.2 million to do this from scratch. Uh, so it was total development cost and everything. We had it deployed to three sites 24 hours a day for about a year and a half. So it was effectively running too. And that, that was so cheap that it was just, it didn't support a large budget, you know. They wanted $4 billion to start the Trailblazer program, and it was a, about another double that or triple it after that, so that was the money they were after. And, and we knew the, the, uh, the companies were in, in, uh, in, the, in the House and Senate Intelligence Committees lobbying against us. They wanted to get our program canceled. These were contractors who wanted to feed on all that money. This is the background from the contracting agents. This is the military-industrial complex working together. Uh, and they wanted the money. So, uh, and that was satisfied NSA, the contractors and the, and the and bureaucrats and the empire builders. Uh, the unfortunate part is people had to continue to die to keep it going. That's the bad part. So we're, we're over here in, in Amsterdam, uh, forming a company trying to fix that so we can show the right way and the correct path and hopefully some of the governments over here will start looking at it and say, hey, let's try this and uh, perhaps we can turn this around. Thanks.